mentioned, this is called um, Unification and the Elephant in the Room. And I'm so happy that some of our previous speakers have talked about unification and how important that is actually in order to get this movement going forward. In fact, what Jodian says, this is also just another way that we can unify and get that message out. So to begin with, I wanted to show you this uh, meme that many of you may be, am I standing in front of it? I don't have all that much room here. They say, everybody sees this, and when activists see this, you know, they sort of nod their heads, heads and they say, ah, yes, sheeple. Isn't it sad that people don't understand their power and collectively move together to topple the 1%? But I'm here today to actually talk to you about what I termed then the elephant in the room and pose the question, why don't all the RBE supporters get together and topple the one percent. And in fact, I could even go further and say, why don't all the people who are involved in activism that promotes sustainability, that, uh, no, what's the word I'm looking for? Help me out with this. <laughs> the uh, evolved use of technology of open source and in the short term or long term, a moneyless, propertyless world, why don't they get together and become that critical mass that toppled the 1%? In other words, to paraphrase Chuck Fresco, why don't we get together and make this shit go? <laughs> I'm going to talk to you today about some of the reasons, some information, and some solutions related to those reasons, and finally, my own experience working with unity. Now, the first reason you might hear people say, uh, um, list when asked, why don't people get together with RBE and work together, is, well, actually, what we have to do is educate people. We have to win enough people to get together so that we can actually get enough numbers to change things. But actually, what may be surprising to you is the fact that we already have achieved critical mass. Now, how can I make this claim? And I'm going to have to start looking at my notes now. I've pretty much finished up with a memorized part. <laughs> I'm, I'm really, I'm old school, you know. You see these guys reading from the Mac book. I hate Mac books. <laughs> um, so, um, and I'm going to have to not be so vain, put on my glasses all very well rehearsed this, yeah. Um, so, okay, critical mass. So when I talk about critical mass, of course, I'm talking about it in the sense that it's used in sociological literature as the sufficient number of adopters of a new innovation in order to become self-sustaining and support increased growth. It's taken, of course, from quantum physics, which is the term used for the amount of uranium in the process to sustain the reaction. So when I say we've already achieved critical mass, what do I actually mean? Well, in 2006, as you can see here, <coughs> Paul Hawkins said in his book, Blessed Unrest, that there were already uh, 100,000 groups in the US alone to, dedicated to social economic, changing the socioeconomic system. Uh, in the meantime, Currently, on the website by Hawkins, he cites that in the USA, oh sorry, the, he estimated 250,000. He said in the USA today, right now, there are 100,000 alone. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg, in his famous manifesto speech in 2016, <coughs> said that there were 100 million groups on Facebook alone working on social change. That's a lot. And United Earth taking the growth, the exponential growth in technology, communication, and internet says that if you take Hawkins' original prediction in 2006 and apply a modest number of growth, we can actually think about 500,000 to a million <coughs> groups on the planet today working with the aim of changing the socioeconomic reality. Now, if you just imagine that each of these groups have about 350 people, 
we're talking about 350 million people. You know how much they say is necessary for critical mass to change things? Five to 10 percent. We're there. So if this is the case, what am I going to say now? If this is the case, we, although education is absolutely vital and will be vital, and not just for them, but for every single person working for this improvement, if uh, education in terms of strategy to get more people is sort of a red herring. And it sort of helps us to keep looking out there instead of looking in here. So, oh, look at that. Besides that, what, when we have this amount of people that I just mentioned, 350 million, we're moving from the area in Roger's uh, curve of diffusion of innovation. We're moving from the 2.5% of the innovators that's always necessary to start social change. And we're moving into the area of the opinion leaders, right? So we're going on that upward curve. So that brings us to reason two, and this was something that you also very uh, clearly identified. How do we know who's working? If there's all these groups, how do we know who's working, where they're working, how we can get in touch with them? And this is a really valid argument. We don't. Just in the past year, since I've been working as the organizer for Moving Forward RBE Learning Network, I've already made personal contact with all representatives from all of these different groups. Now on the left you see pretty much groups that are working with a program and uh, a concept about social change and uh, in the lower part you see organizations that are unifying activities for those parties. You see here on the left also uh, to respond to you about projects and things, getting in touch with people, I saw at the uh, Z Day in Frankfurt at the beginning of April, there was, a, there was a guy who was talking from GreenNet, they're getting all kinds of data together. Uh, the Global Purpose Movement, Global Echo Village, Open Source Networks. Again, there's a lot of this, but there's no overall source where we can find out who is who's, what's doing what, and where is where. So that data library really needed. And it is being worked on. So let's get to reason three. And you touched on that about arguments. When we saw that list of parties, you might have seen a group that you thought, eh, I don't really agree with everything they have there. Eh, they've got some serious flaws in their logic. Mm, I don't know if I can work with them. We're getting down to our likes and dislikes, our reactions to the information that people give, give us. And this is where I want to really look, because this, I think, is the elephant in the room. Now, when I, uh, uh, I used to be very much like this myself. I come from a background, didn't mention this in my bio. <laughs> By the way, sorry for all that bragging and stuff, but I had to make you see that I do have a little bit of a background in what I'm about to tell you. Um, but what I didn't mention is that when I was in university, I was a revolutionary communist. And on May 1st, I was out there on the streets, and I had the banner, and I thought, this is it. And then I went to the PRC, which I did mention, in 1983, okay? So Deng Xiaoping was hardly cold, as, uh, I mean, Mao Zedong was hardly cold in his grave when I was there. So I thought that I would really see something about the kind of communism that I thought, the, the changes that I thought would take place. And what I did learn in the two years that I lived there was that it takes more than a redistribution of goods and a change of the uh, relationship between workers and production to really get social change. You've got to do something with the values that the people are working from and the consciousness that they aspire to. So I decided to spend my time working on my own consciousness. In the couple of years in what I call then uh, activism isolation, I was working on cleaning up the conditioning that I saw was really standing in the way of being an effective uh, member of change. Until I saw Zeitgeist. 
oh, what joy when I saw that there were actually people on this planet that saw the things the way they are, too. And that really changed my life. And for a long time, I was just a, pa uh, a passive supporter of TVP and TCM until last year when Jacques Fresco died. And I was asked to help organize this online learning network, which was mentioned, Moving Forward RBE Learning Network. But still, at the beginning of these talks, I only asked people from TVP or TCM. So again, I was, ah, those other groups, ah, I don't know about that. Until I saw that respected members of TVP and TCM were also on the pages of those other groups. And they took the people with those ideas seriously. So I started inviting people from Copiosis, from Ubuntu, Money Free Party, Free World Charter, uh, Ar Aravana was my last uh, interview, and I found out Although there were some things that I, I had questions about, there was a lot more that I could support. So, what is it that gets us to react like this? Well, I want to move now on to something which is not talked about very much, and that's what's behind our reactions. Our reactions, well, we're conscious of what our reactions are. But what motivates them? That, don't know that much. Actually, the, the mind can be really sort of likened to an iceberg. What we're aware of, that's that upper point, part. What we're unaware of, the unconscious, that's that submerged part. Now, some of that submerged part is the consciousness that just keeps our life functions going. Heart beating, breathing, all that stuff that takes place. We don't have to think about it, it just takes place. But there's another part of our unconscious uh, which also responds automatically because it has learned that particular things are safe or dangerous. So, for instance, when you're growing up, if you touch a hot stove, you learn, ah, that's something I shouldn't do. So all of our early experiences teach us basically how to deal with life, how to survive life, and this becomes our unconsciousness. It's also our personal conditioning. Now, this is all part of the neural wiring that takes place. Uh, Peter Joseph talks in his latest book about mirror neurons. He talks about how for instance, he shows it how empathy is one of our strongest qualities. He says, yeah, when, when we see somebody, we often experience the same type of, a type of emotions. So you see a child crying and you get sad. This is the whole thing that gets us hooked into movies or even books, okay? We can relate it to feelings in our own past and that we mirror those feelings. But another aspect of neurons is that they form networks. You've probably heard the saying, uh, neurons that fire together, wire together. So when you have a certain experience and it causes an emotion and that happens repeatedly, that neural path, that stays fixed. So every time, for instance, uh, my, my, my youngest daughter, she got bitten by a dog once when she was roller skating. So every time she sees a big dog coming up to her, something in her body tenses up. Those, that neural pathway is there. See a dog, remember fear, remember dangerous experience, get afraid, fight or flight. So all this stuff is going on unconsciously. So Peter also talks about conditioning. Now there is this personal conditioning that I just mentioned about, about uh, life experiences and how to deal with things, but we are all part of this social conditioning. We're social creatures and we're all socialized and we live in a situation which is based on scarcity. That's the overriding socioeconomic belief. There's not enough, so I have to do this, 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 in order to survive. 
So that com then you get this idea of competition, competition, I have to be better. Or antagonism, oh, this is not good, this is not good, this doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, make me feel relaxed. Or possession, this is mine, I've got to keep it, I can't share it. And all this stuff, we don't even, we're not even aware of it because it all got fed in at a time that we couldn't do anything about it. And we were dependent on the people who took care of us to support us. So what to do? Well, basically, I'm going to tell you a couple of tips that I use when I see that my unconscious mechanisms are kicking in. You mentioned, I think, those Facebook uh, battles. Yeah, oh, I haven't had as much as much fighting on my Facebook pages as I have with other RBE supporters. I mean, it's completely crazy. And why is this? Okay, something gets triggered unconsciously, and immediately you have to defend your viewpoint. You have to show that you're right. You have to. Is it because somewhere in your past? You found out, oh, if you, if you give in, uh, then you're nobody, then nobody wants to help you, things like that. So when I feel emotion, I know my conditioning has kicked in. Now, conditioning is not bad. It helps me survive. But when it becomes counterproductive, when I can't listen to other people, if I don't stand open for other people's point of view, say, oh, okay, conditioning, got to give you a rest. Now this is from transactional analysis, and I'm not going to go into it in great deal. I know you're all intelligent enough and resourceful enough to find out more in, uh, information material yourselves. But this is so simple. Basically, just talks about three levels of consciousness coming from the adult, uh, from the parent, the adult, and the child, and sort of sort of similar to the superego, the ego, and the uh, what is it again? The uh, the id, yeah. So, and, and, and this sort of defines, you know, so when I, when I hear myself being moralistic, oh, but you should know better than that, oh yeah, I'm coming from the critical parent, or I'm not going to listen to you, why should I listen to you, I'm just going to do what I want, oh yeah, I'm the defiant child, okay, also, no problem, but when you're trying to listen and cooperate with people, if you can get to that non-judgmental sharing of information from the adult, then you got a much better chance of success. Another thing is nonviolent communication. Even when my hormones and my, my blood is racing and my heart is beating in my Facebook, I'm reading my Facebook, some guy criticizing what I had to say, and ah, okay, I'm gonna respond with nonviolent communication. So instead of calling him an idiot, I mean, how much cooperation is that going to get? None, okay? So by, by, by using words, well, I'm sorry, I, I'm afraid I don't agree. Could you explain exactly why, how you've come to that conclusion? Ask for information, things like that. NVC, this is also a really well-documented technique, so I'm not going to go into great detail here, but really, it's so important, especially when talking with other RBE supporters, to use nonviolent communication. Again, other, another easily found uh, source from NVC, instead of accusing somebody else of making you feel some way, talk about what you need. Tell them how you feel and what you need and how things can go forward. Works much better. Now, the third thing I want you to remember finally is, no matter what differences in accent, interests, hobbies, or whatever there is with people who are basically still united for this sustainability and evolved use of technology, of open source, and working towards a moneyless, propertyless society, we share more than there are things different. Share the same planet, same resources, same needs. We're all made of stardust, as our friend Carl Sagan says. And as my hero David Bohm says, we are but expressions of the implicit order, implicit order of the subquantum zero field arising into form 
and disappearing back into that field. All the same. Now, I said I was going to talk a little bit about my work with unification. Since uh, January, I've been in the core team of the World's Summit Global, as Jody and has is as well. And this is a group of individuals, uh, the core team of which we are members, uh, representing 14 different groups, all working towards the same future. And what we are doing is we're organizing an event. We're organizing an event for people from as many different groups, interests, etc., all working for the same purpose, to come sit at the same table to get together. We're not going to tell them what they have to do. That's what they're going to share. They're going to share the most valuable, the, mo the, the unique answers, the interests. Each group has their own spe specific expertise. Get them together. Let's make a plan and let's implement it. And if we've got that 350 million people with those groups, then there's a real chance of flipping the paradigm sooner rather than later. Nobody has to change what they're doing. Nobody has to unite under a particular banner, a motto, or creed, except the ones that we all share anyway, or that we create together. It's like I have this body here. I really love this analogy. Got it from an Ubuntu, Ubuntu uh, uh, presentation of all of the different organizations working together unconsciously already. Just like the different organs and parts of the body work together unconsciously. And they are organized unconsciously by the brain. But the thing is, the house is on fire. We don't have time. We don't have time. Every prediction of, of environmental collapse is taking place earlier than predicted. It's increasing exponentially. We don't have the time for it to happen naturally. We have to consciously use our consciousness to go beyond differences, organize together, and get things started. And there was one thing I wanted to say important. I forgot what it is. Um, I couldn't be perfect, right? So, with this, I would like to close my presentation just reminding you that it's time for us, as the 99%, to get together, all of us, change the system, topple the 1%. If you like what you saw, you like what you hear, you can find more these places. Got a YouTube channel for Moving Forward, RBE Learning Network. Everybody is invited to attend. Got a Facebook page, got the Zoom uh, link. You just show up, you listen, you contribute, that's it. Films on YouTube. Uh, I've been starting writing essays. You can find them on Medium. And of course, please do visit the World Summit Global Facebook pages, website, I've listed, uh, uh, sorry, I've, I've put some brochures on the bar about the World Summit Cafe. If you think this is a group that I would like to support, spread the message, you can do that. We're building a network in all the countries of people setting up cafes who will be linked virtually uh, uh, at, for the big event so that it really is something that takes place over the world. Yeah? Sorry if I took up too much time. Going to let you go. Have a great pause. If you got any a break, if you got any questions, come to me. Thank you.